Hi guys, welcome to Brain Blitz Audios. In this episode of Mind Maps, we'll be dealing with the fourth chapter in the physics syllabus of grade 12 CBSE. The name of the chapter is Moving Charges and Magnetism. This video is basically a revision. So we've enlisted the help of a mind map to complete our objective. Mind maps are great at last minute revisions. However, these can be pretty extensive and therefore this video is put forth to briefly explain each part of a mind map in simple terms so that you can understand what's going on. So let's look at the mind map, shall we? So in this chapter, moving charges and magnetism, we'll be first looking at the introduction which involves Ersted's law. We will then proceed to magnetic field, magnetic force on moving charge, the Bion Savart law, magnetic field due to straight wire current, field due to a long straight wire current, field due to a current carrying circular ring, and then Ampere's law, solenoid, magnetic field due to toroid, force on a current carrying conductor, force between parallel currents. Torque experienced by a loop in uniform magnetic field, definition of an ampere, sensitivity of a galvanometer, and converting a galvanometer to ammeter and voltmeter, respectively. So let's look at our first objective, Ersted's law. Let's look at what is given. In April 1820, Hans Christian Ersted discovered that flow of current in a wire can deflect a nearby magnetic compass needle. So he was the first person to give a connection between electricity and magnetism. So it's right to honor his mention in this chapter because we're dealing with magnetism and its effect on moving charges. So Hans Christian Ersted was one of the first scientists to explore this field and he uh, and his experiment showed the relation between electricity and magnetism the, which later proved by Maxwell is the same thing which is known as electromagnetism. Let's move on to a magnetic field. What is a magnetic field? So, you know that a magnet is a material which has an inherent property of magnetism and it has a north and south poles. However, the magnetic field is the area around a magnet or in its place a current carrying conductor in which its magnetic effect can be felt. So, in this area, if we place another object, which is ferromagnetic, diamagnetic, or, or, or related to magnetism, such as iron, cobalt, etc., then it experiences a force. So that means the magnetic effect of the magnet inside will be felt by this test object. So uh, magnetism is an inherent property of elements. And it's a special property that is attributed to only a few uh, compounds such as neodymium, iron, cobalt, nickel, etc. And it is also applicable to electric currents because electricity and magnetism are related. The SI unit for a magnetic field is known as Tesla. So Tesla is basically Newton, which is the unit of force, divided by coulombs, which is the unit for charge, and then meters per second, which is the unit for velocity. So it becomes Newton second by coulomb meter. And this is named as Tesla in honor of Nikola Tesla. The man who found it out, AC current was better than DC current. Now, the unit Tesla is defined as the magnetic field produced 
when a one coulomb charge creates a force of one newton traveling at one meters per second and it is a very large unit and in conventional terms we use a smaller unit known as a gauss and a gauss is defined as 10 raised to minus 4 tesla so one gauss is one by 10 raised to 4 that is one with four zeros tesla let's look at magnetic force on moving charge the force formula that we get is f is equal to q into v cross v bar cross b bar now this formula was given by a scientist named lawrence who found out that the force which is related to z-man effect would be the sum of the electric force and magnetic force so from there he found out that the magnetic force would be equal to q times v cross b and the original expression would be q times e plus v cross b now we have two vectors v bar and b bar undergoing a cross product so whenever a cross product is present we represent it using sine theta so the magnetic force on a moving charge will be equal to q v b sine theta f stands for force q stands for charge v stands for velocity and b stands for magnetic field now there are a couple of things about this formula when theta is equal to zero sine theta would be equal to sine zero which is equal to zero so since it's multiplied to all the other quantities the whole force when it is along the line of the magnetic field would be equal to zero so f is zero along the magnetic field for theta is equal to 90 degrees so that means when sine theta is equal to sine 90 and sine 90 becomes one so so that means if the charge's velocity is perpendicular to the field direction the force is perpendicular to both field and velocity so this is velocity this is the electric field then the force will also be perpendicular in a third dimension now in some cases the magnetic force qeb which is perpendicular to the direction of the field is the same as centripetal force because when a charge undergoes magnetic force in perpendicular direction it forms a circular path and in a circular path the center seeking force aka centripetal force would be given by the magnetic force so both forces are equal so qvb is equal to mv squared by r and upon further simplification you get r which is the radius of the circular path r is equal to mv by qb m is the mass of the material v is the velocity that it undergoes q is its charge and b is the magnetic field in which this rotation takes place now using this formula we can get the time period of the rotation of a charge as 2 pi m divided by qb now 2 pi is a constant where the value of pi will be equal to 3.14159265 and it goes on and m is the mass of the charge q is the amount of charge in coulombs and b is the magnetic field in teslas or gausses so 
since frequency since the frequency is the inverse or the reciprocal of the time period so we would get frequency as qb by 2 pi m again all the values remain the same if theta is not equal to zero degrees or 180 degrees or 90 degrees then the force would be equal to qvb sine theta that means if it's zero then it's parallel if it's 90 it's perpendicular and if it's 180 it becomes anti-parallel so if these three cases are not present then the general formula of force due to a moving charge will be f is equal to qvb sine theta and since it's not present in any of these forms such as zero degree 180 degree or 90 degree then the charged particle instead of for following a circular path would follow something of a circular path but it's also displacing a certain distance say d then the move the motion is known as helical motion and here r is equal to mv1 by qb and here m stands for mass v stands for velocity q stands for charge b stands for magnetic field and the pitch of this helical motion would be equal to velocity into time period that is velocity into 2 pi m divided by qb let's move on to the next important principle that's biot savart law what is the biot savart law let's find out it says that the magnetic field will be equal to 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught c square into i dl bar cross r bar divided by r cube so what it states is that all magnetic fields that we know are due to currents or moving charges and due to intrinsic magnetic moments of particles which is due to the charge that is c flowing in the conductors so in the biot law we have a conductor and we have a particle p present here at a distance r from the conductor and then we have an element of the conductor dl and we have an element of current here and then there is an angle theta between the distance and the element of current so according to biot law the magnitude of the magnetic field db will be proportional to i it will be proportional to dl it will be inversely proportional to r square and it will also be proportional to sine theta so the reason why sine theta comes here because the equation becomes a cross product so db will be equal to i dl bar cross r bar divided by r cube and to make it an equality sign they use a constant of proportionality which is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught into c square c is not coulombs it is the speed of light so on further simplification this whole constant becomes mu naught by 4 pi which has a value of 10 raised to minus 7 and then we get the other side as i dl sine theta because dl bar cross r bar becomes dl r sine dl sine theta and then the r gets cancelled with the r cube in the denominator so that the denominator becomes r square so the final formula is db which is magnetic fields would be equal to mu naught by 4 pi constant in magnetism i which is the 
amount of current, dl, which is the element of the length of the conductor, sine theta is the sine ratio of the theta angle, and divided by r square, r is the distance between the point p and the conductor. So over here, we consider mu naught as one by epsilon naught c square. And that's the reason why it, the whole constant became mu naught by four pi. So since mu naught by four pi is 10 raised to minus seven, mu naught by itself will be equal to four pi into 10 raised to minus seven. It's important to note that the direction of the field will be perpendicular to the plane containing current element and the point of observation. So if all of this drama happens in a two dimensional field, then the direction of the magnetic field itself will either point out of the paper or inside the paper. If we have a symbol like this, it means that the, the field is going towards the paper. It's going towards it. And then when it, there's a dot symbol, then it's coming out of it, the field lines. So that's the notation for the electric field's direction in Biot-Savart law. Let's look at some magnetic fields. Magnetic field due to a straight wire current is given by the formula B is equal to mu naught I divided by four pi D into cos theta one minus cos theta two. So we have an arrangement like this, where this is the straight current carrying conductor. We have two points A and B, which are inclined with the straight conductor at an angle theta one and theta two respectively. And so the formula that we get is mu naught by four pi, which is the constant. I is the current. D is distance, and and then we get and we take the cos of cos function, so that means the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse on both sides. That means this part. So ratio of this by that. So then that's cos theta one minus cos theta two since we have two points. So the final formula of magnetic field becomes mu naught i divided by four pi d into cos theta one minus cos theta two. Now, this is when the straight current is this. This happens when the straight conductor is fixed. It has a fixed length, say L or R. Now, what would happen if this conductor, say, stretched to infinity? Then theta one would then start becoming smaller and smaller until it approaches zero. So theta one will be equal to zero. And theta two would try to move on and on and on and on and on and on and on until it becomes pi. So basically it comes out to the other side and then it becomes pi. So theta two is equal to pi. So then our original formula will become mu naught i divided by four pi d into cos of theta one, which is cos of zero, which is one, minus cos of, which is cos of pi will be minus one. So then that becomes mu naught i into two divided by four pi d to Two goes into four two ice so that gives you this formula magnetic field is equal to mu naught by two pi into i by d now what happens when we have a magnetic field due to a current carrying circular ring so we have a ring and then it moves some distance now Field at the center, that's this part, 
will be equal to mu naught i divided by 2a. So mu naught is a constant, i is the current, and 2a would be the distance. B, when the field is at an axial point, so suppose we have an axis like this passing through the center, and suppose we have the we have to measure the magnetic field at a point A, say, which is at some distance from this ring. So then the magnetic field would be mu naught I into A square divided by 2 into A, which over here the A becomes A square plus D square, the whole raised to 3 by 2. And for a field at a point far away from the center, let's say at infinity, so that means this nearly becomes parallel. So then the d square would cease to exist. I mean, the a square would cease to exist, actually, and this d square would be present. So the magnetic field would be equal to mu naught i a square divided by 2 dq. So those are the three formulas for the magnetic field due to a current carrying circular ring. Now, let's look at another important law in this chapter. That is the Ampere's law. Most of you have learned of Ampere as someone who found out the amount of current. Let's look at what Ampere's law have to do with moving charges and magnetism. Now, this Ampere's law is an, is an alternative. And the alternative is to the Biot-Savart law. And it's also more appealing. Ampere's circuital law considers an open surface with a boundary. The surface has current passing through it. So let's say we have a surface, sort of, like this. Then we have it placed in an electric field. So what, what it says is that the surface has current passing through it and we consider the boundary to be made up of a number of small line elements. So this is a circular um, surface. So we, have, we, we, we consider it to be made of small elements known as DL. So we consider one such element of length DL. We take the value of the tangential component of the magnetic, B, magnetic field BT at this element. So say, like that. So if this is the magnetic field, and then this would be the component. And then we multiplied by the length of that length of that element, which is DL. So all such products are added together. We consider the limit as the length of elements get smaller and, they num and their number gets larger. The sum then tends to become an integer. And Ampere's law states that this integer that's the sum of all the fields of all the elements would be equal to mu naught times i, which is the total current crossing the area bounded by the closed curve. Now we found this particular symbol here. Now this is an integral symbol, but the reason why it has a circle on it is because it is integral over a closed surface. As you can see, this is a closed surface and B stands for magnetic field, into DL, which stands for the element D. So we find the component of the magnetic field, multiply it with the length of the element DL. We do an integral over the closed surface, and we find that it's equal to mu naught times the total current crossing the area bounded by the closed curve. That, in short, is Ampere's law. It so we've learned about Ampere's law, but where is it applied? These are the two cases where Ampere's law is applied. 
what is a solenoid? So a solenoid is a current carrying conductor that's twisted like this. So it's a helical conductor, but it travels in its axis in a straight line. So it has some distance d traveling in an axis, axial straight line. And at a point on one end, that's this part, the magnetic field of the solenoid given by B will be equal to mu naught constant, which is 4 pi into 10 raised to minus 7, N i divided by 2, where N stands for the number of turns per unit length along the length of the solenoid, sort of density, and I is current passing through the solenoid. Current. Okay. So that is known as a solenoid. So a solenoid is a helical conductor which travels in a straight line, its mean distance, but it its actual length is derived from the helical component. And the magnetic field will be equal to mu naught times the number of rotation per unit length times the current divided by two. Now, what is a toroid? This is the second case given here. Well, a toroid and a solenoid are related. The difference is that a toroid is a sort of circular of circular solenoids. I know that my drawing isn't clear, but if you have an actual picture, it would be something similar to this. So it has these helical coils running in a circle of, let's say, radius R, and, and you have these helical components running until they meet at the point, and then they move back to the power source. So then this is known as a toroid. So it's basically a solenoid that is curved. It's curved into a closed curve. That's bent into a closed curve. Now, in this situation, the uh, we will have a circumference of 2 pi r. So the, the circumference will be with respect to the magnetic surf to the uh, current surfaces that we have. So that's represented by these. So basically, this is the outside, this is the inside of the solenoid, the, the toroid. This is the line passing through the, through the area where the, um, where the iron core passes through the toroid. And this is the exterior of it. So this line, this circle and this circle are zero. And the magnetic field is only measured at the place where the iron core is passed through the toroid and then that area and in that area the magnetic field b will be equal to mu naught into n into i divided by 2 pi r 2 pi r is a is circumference and stands for total number of rotation turns that means the total number of times that this toroid the elements of the toroid gets turned and I stands for the current passing through this toroid. So those are the application of Ampere's law. Again, if we go and revise, the Ampere's law will be this. And the applications are both of these. Now, let's move on to force and torque on various conductors. Let's look first at a force on a current carrying conductor. The force on a current carrying conductor, that is this, which is present in a magnetic field E, B, actually so e is for electrical and b is for magnetic so this is the magnetic field b and then this is the current carrying conductor passing through it current i so we need to find 
the force on this conductor because of the magnetic field. And that is given by DF is equal to I into DL cross B. And when it's when the electric field and the current carrying conductor move along the same way, then the force F will be equal to ILB. Otherwise, when you do integration, F will be equal to some IDLB sine theta because uh, we have a cross product here. But we only need to study force of a current carrying conductor, which is parallel to the electric field. So that will be F equal to ILB. F is force, I is the current, L is the length of conductor, and B is the magnetic field present. Now, suppose we have two parallel conductors which have current flowing in the same direction. So they'll have a repulsing force, uh, sort of like this. So then they start moving away from each other. If the currents are the same and they start moving towards each other, if the currents are different, say like if positive, negative or negative, positive, then it will attract. And if it's positive, positive or negative, negative, then it will start to repel. So what is the force, whether attractive or repulsive, experienced in this situation? So then we have in first conductor, it's I1, second conductor, it's I2, the current, and then there is, a, and then there is this distance D. So the force between the parallel currents is given by F is equal to mu naught I1, I2 divided by two pi D. So in an earlier formula, we got F is equal to mu naught by two pi into I by D. Now over here, we have two currents. So that's I1 times I2. And then, and then that gives you this formula, the force between the parallel currents. Now, what is the torque experienced by a loop in uniform magnetic field? It is given by the formula pi bar is equal to mb sine theta n cap. So basically that is magnetic, magnetic force. This is magnetic field. And then this is sine theta. So that becomes M cross B because if, M, if, the, if it's MB sine theta, then we know that it's a cross product. So that becomes M cross B. And then there is a vector N cap representing the direction. Now, we know that ampere is the unit of electric current in our studies of electricity. But as an SI unit, how is an ampere defined? So suppose we have two parallel wires and these run to infinity, then the distance between them is one meter. So if one ampere current passes through, okay, let's draw that again. So we have current carrying conductors, infinite, we have one ampere current and then we have a distance of one meter between the currents okay i obviously overstepped this boundary so let's go back so this is the actual definition of an ampere so so over here we have a one meter distance between them between the two conductors which are infinitely long and if one ampere is passed through both of the currents, then there exists a force whose value will be equal to two into 10 raised to minus seven. So suppose we don't know that how much of the current is given. And so we kept both of these conductors at one meter and we measured the force exerted and we find that the force value is equal to two into 10 raised to minus seven. Then you would know that one ampere of current 
is passing through both of these current both of these conductors because that is the definition of ampere if two parallel wires kept one meter apart are given in a setup then the value of force will be 2 into 10 raised to minus 7 for the current in both conductors to be 1 ampere. Now, you know that for measuring the electric current and voltage, we use a device known as a galvanometer. Now, what is the sensitivity of a galvanometer? Now, so a galvanometer has some divisions and it measures either electric current or voltage and so sensitivity is defined as such when we give a small amount of current say di this deflection in the galvanometer moves by a large distance say say x so the increase in the value of x when we give a short amount of current that's di is known as the sensitivity of the moving coil galvanometer so the sensitivity is given as nba by k so n is the number of coils because it's a moving coil galvanometer and then b stands for magnetic field a stands for area okay area of cross section and divided by k is a constant so basically the sensitivity is measured in theta so the actual equation is k theta will be equal to nba so theta will be equal to nba divided by k conversion of a galvanometer to an ammeter and a voltmeter so ammeter measures current only while voltmeter measures voltage that is electric potential difference only a galvanometer measures both and when we do some changes on the galvanometer we will get this sort of situation a galvanometer as an ammeter what we do is this is the galvanometer and then we keep a resistor a a, a resistor of resistance r and r is very low and then we keep it in parallel so then we have an i then there is an ig and there is an it so so this is series this no, no this is s which is used to represent this phenomenon and which is equal to the uh, current due to passing through the galvanometer divided by the current passing through the whole system into the current passing through the galvanometer into the value of the galvanometer itself that's capital g and if we want to change a galvanometer to a voltmeter that's even simpler so basically we we connect a high resistor so r is very high and then we connect it in series so when we have the uh, current ig flowing through both of these so r which is the r which is the value used here is equal to v that's the voltage of the voltage due to the current passing through the resistor r divided by the current which is ig minus the capital g now capital g is the resistance due to a galvanometer So that's how you convert an ammeter, a galvanometer to either an ammeter by connecting in parallel which a low resistor or a voltmeter by connecting a high resistor, high valued resistor 
to a galvanometer in series. And so that concludes this chapter, moving charges and magnetism. We've taken all 12 points and have understood them in some detail. Did you know that Brain Blitz Audios is a free channel dedicated to providing quality educational content to all? To be a part of our journey, please click the subscribe button and like this video. See you soon until our next upload. Bye-bye.